Welcome everyone to another Performance Clinic Advanced Kubernetes Monitoring with Dynatrace. I am Andy Grebner, and with me today is Alice Meyer, and I can today look at my left. And I see him, hey. And I can look to my right. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> it's actually great to be in the same room. We're here in our new office in Linz, our new headquarter, uh, engineering headquarter, which is pretty cool, on the sixth floor. Um, yeah, awesome to, to have you here. And uh, without further ado, I really want to jump into the topic. Kubernetes is a big thing, right? A lot of our customers are looking into Kubernetes, are running it in production or in pre-prod and using Dynatrace. And we get a lot of questions, and I'm sure you as well, from a product management side. What, you know, how do we really take advantage of it, some best practices, what's coming? And that's why I've invited you. Yep, that's right. And so, Let's get you know, take it away. I will cut my video. Actually, I think we should cut the video so that people have more more screen, right? But at least they see us in the beginning. That's good. And then we'll, we'll bring it back later on for Q&A. So, folks, make sure you ask your questions in the question feature of go to webinar. And if you watch this offline, go to answers.dynatrace.com, and you can also ask questions or reach out directly to us. You have our, our Twitter accounts, and I'm sure you'll find a way to figure out how to send us an email as well uh, in case you need to. All right. Cool. Alice, take it away. All right, yeah, thanks, uh, Andy, for the introduction. Um, happy to be here again. So we've done a performance clinic, I think, last year. I think it was so. mainly focused on, on the operator, Yeah, exactly. like our new approach on how to monitor Kubernetes environments. Mm -hmm. And this is actually also a part I would like to start with today. Um, so first of all, just for the agenda, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of agendas, but since this is a recording, uh, will be a coming recording. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, I think it makes sense mm -hmm. to, to see what, what will come. So first of all, how to roll out full stack, like getting like QMD, this observability done the right way. Uh, then the way how we actually monitor, deep monitor uh, all the pods and containers uh, that are running on your community's environment. A new feature which, uh, which we released about the systematic rollout of one agents mm -hmm. um, to large environments. And then I would like to um, just talk a little bit about what's coming. And at the end of the day, um, doing like a hands-on demo. Perfect. So <clears throat> this is the way how we think it's the best to actually monitor and get visibility into the internals and what's happening on, on your community's environment. So we were working together with Red Hat on the operator framework uh, and came up with the one agent operator that actually rolls out the one agent on every Kubernetes worker node. You can also roll it out to the master nodes. And once the one agent is there, uh, you will uh, the agent will automatically inject into all the, the processes that are running in the containers in, in Kubernetes and all new containers. So this allows us to actually monitor large environments in, in a couple of minutes. It's pretty cool. There is no need to change um, the Docker images mm -hmm. uh, or like the application images. Uh, in order to get monitoring for that. Um, but um, we, of course, in very large environments, we want to have a way to control how to actually uh, monitor these applications. So in large environments, usually you have like dev spaces uh, or you know, namespaces uh, where teams are working on that are, do not want to opt into monitoring yet. Mm -hmm. So this is why we came up with a new concept called container injection rules, which is the last um, mm -hmm. item here on this list, which allows you to control in which pods, in which containers you would actually like to inject an agent into. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, quickly interject yeah. here? Uh, also, again, reminder, folks, if you are, if you just joined, you can ask questions to the question feature and go to webinar. Um, injection rules. That's a, a topic that that came up a lot with the folks that I've been working with, just as you said. I want to instrument only certain parts of my cluster. Uh, are you showing this later on a little bit more, or do you have material on, on how this actually works? I have uh, a screenshot in here that you can see where to find it, Perfect. but the way how it works is basically whenever a new container is being started on the machine, on the node, the one agent will will evaluate the rules you defined, and based on the, the, the these rules, it will inject the code modules like, for instance, the Java code module, the Go mm -hmm. code module, the .NET code module, uh, into these containers. Yes, sir. Perfect. So that's the way how it works. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and we also uh, have been working on increasing the footprint in, 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 let's say, all these container environments. So Docker has been around for quite some time now, but 
We have other container runtimes being pretty popular right now. So Cryo uh, is one of those investments we did, uh, which allows us to actually got day one support for OpenShift environments, for OpenShift 4, uh, because they OpenShift switched to Cryo container runtime. We also have Container D, which actually allows us to to to, to monitor, to deep monitor, um, let's say, manage Kubernetes offerings that uh, run with Container D as the underlying runtime. Mm -hmm. A question just comes in from Luis. Uh, I think we've covered this in the previous performance <laughs> clinic, but the question is, installing the one agent at worker node is the only way to monitor pause, question mark? Yes. Right? Yeah. So with the installation of the one agent by rolling out the operator, the operator will roll out the agent to the nodes, and this way, the one agent will will inject into the pod uh, and monitor what's running inside the pod, mm. which is which is critical. Mm. But the good news is you don't have to install it manually on yeah. each node. We're using the operator framework that enables you know vendors like us to automate some of these tasks, and that's like rolling out the one agent fully automatically. That's right? correct. Whenever you add an additional node to your Kubernetes environment, the operator will automatically roll out the agent. Mm -hmm. and start monitoring uh, this, this new node. Mm -hmm. So it basically scales the same way how you scale your Kubernetes environment. Yeah. And then with the injection rules, you can then actually control what level of visibility you want to have into the individual you know, things that actually run in your Kubernetes cluster. That's correct. Yeah. So this is basically a screenshot I did from, uh, from, from my environment. So where we, we have these injection rules down here, so container monitoring rules. Uh, where you can define um, you want to monitor or do not want to monitor um, pods and containers, applications mm -hmm. running in a certain Kubernetes namespace cool. mm -hmm. or with a certain pod name, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so it's really just a rule-based approach uh, which will then be transferred to all the agents and, and they will then uh, you know, monitor these, uh, these pods uh, or not. Cool, it's really flexible because it, it's obviously it's a rules engine, right? You can define rules and say, I enable certain teams, I enable certain pods if they just uh, kind of um, uh, follow a certain naming scheme or put some metadata on it. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's correct, yeah. So what we uh, often see is that in environments where customers do not want to monitor the dev um, pods, uh, they just add a rule here which says, um, you know, um, do not monitor everything that runs in a Kubernetes namespace that starts with dev. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. perfect. Uh, also a question that just comes in, I think it just fits. Uh, are we supporting EKS? Uh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so full support for EKS, for GKA, uh, AKS, AKS, AKS OpenShift. Yeah, yeah. GKS, yeah. all the star, dot, or star KS. Yeah, exactly, perfect. Yeah. Um, and then he's also asking a uh, follow-up question, are the, the hosts that are also the host of the part of AKS clusters, yeah. I mean, it's yes, it's, of course, it's all there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, all right, keep going. I know, I know there's questions coming in now, and folks, I will I will throw them over uh, if I see fit now. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep some of them to later. Yeah. So what's also important is uh, that uh, the environment needs to scale. So customers usually do not only have one Kubernetes environment or OpenShift environment; they actually run like a handful or a tenth of, of environments. Uh, and interestingly, these in, uh, environments actually interact with each other. So usually you have workload deployed on one cluster, let's say in US East, uh, which is actually also um, um, you know, sending traffic to, to, to a cluster that runs somewhere else, even in, 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 in their own data center or, I don't know, US West or somewhere. So it's really important to also have like this cross-cluster visibility uh, in, in, in your monitoring environment. But this is really like a crazy fast, uh, uh, let's say, overview of, of, of what we actually already mentioned last time uh, in, in our last uh, performance clinic. But we were also working hard and all, actually also released a couple of new uh, features that allows us to address other use cases. Mm -hmm. And you probably need to, to, to talk to your doctor. Uh, after viewing this, you would really like to use these features. Mm -hmm. um, so one of those is, uh, in, in terms of advanced visibility, some of you might know that already. So we introduced uh, a new capability which allows you to do capacity planning on, on a cluster level, which basically makes sure that you will better understand when, when it's time to, to, to add new, um, new nodes, 
so that you can run more more workload uh, on on these environments. So it's really like a, a strong focus on on cluster utilization and and, and scalability. Mm -hmm. So this is being released already. The next one would be um, Kubernetes native events. Uh, so this is uh, this screenshot. I think I took this screenshot uh, today or yesterday mm -hmm. from one of our dev environments. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will bring basically Davis to Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So the Kubernetes events uh, API actually exposes lots of events. It's kind of like a log stream actually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we build ways that where you can basically subscribe to certain patterns of these events. Mm -hmm. So you can say, for instance, I have a namespace which is very critical to me. I would like to get all the events from Kubernetes for a certain namespace. Mm -hmm. um, or you could, can add something like, I'm interested in all events that are related to a node um, because this is a critical uh, thing for me. Uh, so there will be a subscription mechanism that actually allows you to subscribe to, to some of these nodes. Uh, and this will be fed into Dynatrace. Perfect. So as you probably see me typing, there's a lot of questions already coming in. I want to throw one over right away because it fits this this uh, screen. Uh, any estimate? You said this is uh, in the in the dev environment right now. Any estimate on when this uh, capability will become available for our customers? So we plan early next year. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot communicate any quarter any mm -hmm. longer, but it will be early next year. Early next year, perfect. And then the other question that uh, so hopefully she said that this answers your question, right? This is the stuff that you were asking for. The other thing that came in, because earlier we talked about EKS, AKS, GK support, uh, the question is, are we also supporting, he, he call, Manuel calls it custom-made Kubernetes clusters. I would assume he's talking about installing Kubernetes on-premise in any environment. So are we supporting general Kubernetes? Yes. So, so as long as it's vanilla Kubernetes, uh, which is basically upstream Kubernetes, uh, we will support it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we will have uh, uh, dependencies here, so mm -hmm. we need to so it needs to be based on, on a container runtime that we support, mm -hmm. like Docker, ContainerD, Cryo, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so that is important. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's not a problem. Perfect. Actually. And I think this is also all documented, like what container runtimes we support and yes. what Kubernetes is we officially support. And then, uh, Manuel, if you are uh, asking about a specific, you said custom-made Kubernetes cluster, if you have any custom flavor of Kubernetes, or if, if it's just installing Kubernetes on your environment, then that's on-premise. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, that's also what we also are doing. So mm -hmm. we run Kubernetes environments in our lab as well, mm -hmm. which is also just like upstream Kubernetes from. Yeah, perfect. And uh, Pietro, yes, the slides will be made available later on on university.dynatrace.com next to the video. All right, so let's, let's proceed. Uh, one other thing uh, we are working on at the moment is uh, to get like a better and dedicated visibility into deployments and pods and namespaces. Mm -hmm. So with the approach that we have right now where we have an agent-based, you know, detection of pods, uh, which is great already, uh, but we will enrich this information uh, with um, topology information we get from the Kubernetes API uh, to also cover things like um, so how many, how many pods are desired for a certain uh, workload for deployment and how many are actually running. Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Uh, also uh, drilling down on a namespace uh, a basis. So this will also uh, uh, come uh, next year. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And um, so this just was like an overview of this, uh, you know, what, what will come uh, regarding workloads. Uh, so we will also come up with a uh, concept that we call cloud applications. Uh, where you get like deeper visibility into each individual deployment mm -hmm. uh, that is running uh, in a Kubernetes or OpenShift environment, uh, and uh, which we of course uh, connect and relate to to agent related information uh, that we get from from the Kubernetes hosts uh, and where we leverage um, things like C group mm -hmm. uh, to to actually get uh, more uh, more visibility into, for instance, CPU throttling and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Awesome. Uh, as you're moving through it, um, just one other question just came in. Uh, IBM Kubernetes, is that I guess, yes. Yep. Uh, it's there. It's based on ContainerD, mm -hmm. and we support it, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I think they switched the container runtime from Docker to ContainerD in 110 or 111. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's supported, yeah. Uh, 
if you ask yourself how to get started. Uh, so all these capabilities that I just listed here are require Dynatrace ActiveGate uh, because we, we leverage the Kubernetes API and we need the ActiveGate to have like a central node to, to collect that information from the Kubernetes API. So you will need to install an ActiveGate um, somewhere and actually, um, you know, provide us, uh, create a service account with a Biro token and stuff like that. Uh, and connect this uh, Kubernetes environment then with Dynatrace by just adding this um, environment uh, here in, in, in the settings view. And there is already a sneak peek where you can see that uh, in the settings view we will also be able to allow you to subscribe to, 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 to certain field events mm -hmm. uh, based on the field selector mechanism of, of, of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that's pretty much everything from 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 my slide here. Yeah. Uh, there's one more slide. Yeah. Before I want to do a demo. Um, so I was thinking about what we would like to demo, mm -hmm. and I came across uh, the GCP microservices demo uh, repository on, on GitHub, which yeah consists of of kind of like cool and, and new fancy technologies. So lots of Go in there. There's got .NET Core in there, Python in there, almost everything in there, gRPC as protocols for, for talking uh, to other services. And I wanted to, to give it a try and run it on Knative. Mm -hmm. Because Knative is also like a new thing. We see more and more demand on, on Knative mm -hmm. uh, support, uh, where customers would like to use Knative to run their applications in a very easy way. They just would like to deploy their Docker images, their, their container images, and Knative should take care of actually scaling the images based, based or the containers based on demand, uh, kind of like the, the CF push experience. Mm. And it's also like, I mean, Knative is like the, the serverless, it's like a serverless model for your containers. That's, it, that's exactly. correct, yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like running containers in a serverless world on your Kubernetes environment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, cool. And uh, before you go into the demo, I think there's a couple of more questions that just came in and we could maybe address right now. Um, you mentioned full stack monitoring in the beginning, installing the one agent through the operator. Full stack means we really get visibility on the worker nodes into every single process and container that runs on every single worker node. We then do full stack instrumentation, code, code level instrumentation on the services that run. And if you enable also our run capabilities, you also get real user monitoring, right? This is what we mean with full stack. And the question from Manuel goes, uh, if we are adhering to any certain standards uh, when we create, when creating pod and deployments, um, I'm not 100% sure, Manuel, what you mean with the standards when we create pod and deployments, we automatically detect it and then with the events that we additionally get in, yeah. we know when things are moving, when deployments are created and all that. So we are, we are going towards the API yeah. Plus so what we basically do is we enrich the topology information that we already have from from our one agent, which is great. Yeah. Uh, because we we do have all the dependencies, we do have the the vertical topology, kind of like where are these pods running, mm -hmm. which containers are running in there, what are the, the processes and the services running in there, mm -hmm. and where else these same kind of like services are running on which other nodes, so that we can connect all these information so this is is done already uh, what we in extend here uh, with the Kubernetes API is to get like additional information from from the API about what is the desired amount of, of running pods mm -hmm. right for instance uh, because this is critical uh, in order to understand whether the desired amount of pods is actually running uh, because an agent can only measure what's there mm -hmm. the API can tell us uh, what's missing Mm -hmm. Right. So this is why we we we, we work on that. Mm -hmm. cool. I hope this this answers the question. I think I think Manuel was very happy with the answer, and I think he's also looking into more details of the API where we mentioned. But Manuel, you will, I think will a lot of people that may have not seen Dynatrace yet and the capabilities will now see it firsthand in the demo. Yes. So let's let's try to do that. As always, the demo god needs to be on our side. Mm -hmm. um, I actually prepared two uh, demo streams here. And um, so I prepared one demo um, where where we run basically a, a Knative 
um, platform on a Kubernetes environment on Google. And I just need to, to log in here. Um, it actually worked before. Yeah. So I have a, an SSH console here from one of my Google instances uh, actually to connect to the cluster. Right now we are here. All right. So and change, you can make it bigger, I think. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So let's go in there. Um, demo, generic setup. Um, so let's do like a kubectl. Get notes. So in this environment, it's a Google environment. Uh, we run three um, three cluster nodes, mm -hmm. um, three Kubernetes nodes in there, and we can also check uh, what did we actually deploy here. So there are a couple of namespaces here already. I already rolled out the operator. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that in, in, in our last uh, performance clinic. I do not want to repeat that again. Mm -hmm. So the operator is being rolled out. It actually already monitors all the all the the nodes, and now I want to to deploy the hipster shop um, into this environment and see what Dynatrace will detect. Cool. So I prepared, of course, a script uh, for that. It's called deploy hipster shop um, to actually uh, really deploy it, and I would like just to run it. Um, so what it basically does, it creates a new namespace called hipster shop knative. Um, it will create a couple of, um, you know, uh, service accounts and, and secrets and all that stuff, and it will start rolling out the Knative services. Mm -hmm. uh, so Knative will then kick in and roll out Kubernetes deployments uh, based on the Docker images that are, you know, uh, described in the manifest of my of my deployments here. So we can have a look at it uh, right now. Let's do a kubectl get um, pods hipster shop native. Um, so we see that actually uh, all these uh, deployments and pods are, are coming in already. Knative is creating all that stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, deployed a load generator cool. uh, that would actually drive load uh, on these uh, services here. And it will actually take take some time until all these all these folks are up and running. Mm -hmm. So I can just briefly show you how these uh, manifests actually look like. Mm -hmm. So what what's what's in there in order to deploy that? So I have my test app uh, directory here with my Knative stuff in here, and I think there is a services directory. Uh, there's quite some stuff in there. So we have uh, YAML files for every Knative service. Mm -hmm. So think of it like every YAML file here is its own microservice. Uh, and uh, I don't know, let's let's have a look at the product catalog service here. Yeah. And this is pretty much what you need to do in order to deploy um, this, um, this microservice. What you basically do is you define the visibility of uh, this Knative service, which means it should only be available internally mm -hmm. in Kubernetes, so it should not get like an an external IP or or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or or stuff. You also define um, what is like the the desired min scale mm -hmm. of, of, of this uh, service, the max scale, which means Knative will make sure to to scale the number of pods for these deployments uh, based on on the load mm -hmm. in this case. Uh, so it will shut down to zero. And then you know spin up new new pods uh, once the load increases. Now the cool thing from my perspective, and I have been working and playing with Knative in the past, but for those people that have never maybe seen Dynatrace on the Kubernetes cluster, there's nothing you need to do. There's nothing that you need to modify in order to get visibility because the one agent that has been rolled out automatically through the operator is automatically instrumenting all of your namespaces and all of your pods, all of you and it, fully automatically, and that's a nice thing, right? Yeah. And the thing is what you mentioned earlier, if you don't want certain things to be instrumented, you can now use the rule, uh, the new injection rules, and you can say, well, uh, maybe maybe not here, because for whatever reason, yeah. right? Yeah, cool. Yeah, that, that, that's cool, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's let's see uh, if it seems like all these uh, pods uh, should be up and running uh, already. We can also have a look uh, and see where where these uh, nodes are being scheduled. So we even see like the, the Kubernetes nodes, like the environment, like the hosts 
for instance, this front end is being scheduled on this one, mm -hmm. the cluster one, blah, 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 uh, nodes um, are here. So let's let's go back to Dynatrace and see mm -hmm. what we can what we can see here. So actually, this screen was empty before. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a dashboard I created uh, here. So we on the left hand side we see like the Kubernetes environment. So these are the three hosts on Google um, Google. So it's and Google on prem a cheeky on prem uh, oh, cool. cluster. Okay, cool. Uh, which runs on VMware. It's weird. Yeah, but yeah. it's the way how it works. Um, and so these are the three nodes here, and like like basic information about health, like CPU usage, um, memory usage, and stuff like that. Also about the health of the Knative processes. So Knative also runs pods in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. which actually makes sure to to roll out um, the 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 deployments then. That means Sanitrace automatically obviously monitors everything that runs in Kubernetes, including all these services like like a Kubernetes, uh, like like sorry, like a Knative, like an Istio, like it's amazing. That, that's correct. Since yeah. the agent deployed on, on every node through the operator, I uh, will just just you know monitor all the processes that are running on that machine. Mm -hmm. um, no, even though they are running in a container, so mm -hmm. so uh, we do have this deep visibility here. Okay. On the right hand side. Uh, we actually have this hipster shop uh, mm -hmm. microservices here, so it consists of ten of ten uh, services. It's kind of like all these services that we have seen before, mm -hmm. and I just uh, picked up like the front end service where I wanted to show like the, what is the request count. Since we deployed it right now, the load generator already kicked in, so we have like one thousand requests through the load generator. We have response time here, so it's pretty fast actually, one hundred milliseconds mm -hmm. of response time for the front end. Uh, failure rate is good because it's zero, um, and also picked one of the other uh, of the other ones here. So let's let's have a look uh, what else is is being deployed here. So this is the front end. So there's this email service, that service, checkout service, like all these services that we actually have seen uh, being deployed through through Knative. So let's have a look at the front end. So the front end um, right now just deployed it. Um, so this is where we deployed it. All the requests come in, and we can already do an analysis um, uh, how things are working. So we have a response time of 110 milliseconds. Most of the time is spent not within this Go process, mm -hmm. uh, which would be service service execution. Uh, actually, most of the time is spent uh, with interacting with other services. Mm -hmm. So this is typical for microservice environments. So when you have like the front end service, the very first service of which gets all the ingress, right? Uh, it actually the most time this the response time uh, that, that contributes to the response time is due to calls to other services. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, it's basically due to uh, calls to to these services here, and this is really cool for for microservice environments. So we see the requests to the re front end actually end up to requests in the currency service, the product catalog service, in the recommendation service, and all that stuff. So this this is actually great uh, to to really analyze mm -hmm. uh, how how like the the response time um, is 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 um, you know what actually contributes to the response time. Yeah, and actually it was really cool. I mean, uh, Pedro is just asking a question. So. Uh, on a Kubernetes environment, what type of information does Dynatrace have to do diagnostics? What you're showing here actually went straight into a diagnostics view. Yep. Dynatrace is telling you what are the hotspots and how yep. is it code related? Is it database related? Is it related to calling other services? Is it wait time? Is it CPU? Is it log? Is it I/O? You get the same level of visibility down to the code level as you would get with any other type of technology yep. we support. Yeah, which is Go, Java, .NET. Yeah. Yep. Node.js, PHP. Yeah. Yeah. Did I miss something? I, I don't know. Python. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Dimitri, I think you just sent a message, but I think you, um, I think you need to rephrase it again. It seems like Kyrillic. Um, if you could phrase it in, in English, that would be awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is what you will get automatically out of the box uh, without uh, touching uh, your microservices, yeah. which is great because this time monitoring and observability really is a platform feature mm -hmm. and doesn't need to build in into the applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so so teams, a microservices team can really benefit uh, from it uh, like from, from day one. Mm -hmm. 
And to, 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 to add to this, uh, the question is, do you get code level visibility like pure paths through the Kubernetes integration? Well, we get it for the one agent, right? We get it from the one agent. Exactly. Yes. One agent gets rolled out automatically, instruments yeah. everything, and then you get the code level. I can, details. I can basically yeah. show you that here. So what we have is the smart skip view, which basically shows you a real-time model of how things are being deployed in your environment. Um, and we only, you know, pointed out a couple of layers here. Mm -hmm. So what is important? important is always the host. What is important is the process, no matter if it's running in a container, yes or no. Mm -hmm. So the process is important. And the services we, we actually uh, captured. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side you can actually see in this case what are the other services this single front end service is talking to. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, actually there is like this, this product catalog service, there is this recommendation service, there is like a shipping service. Mm -hmm. So you will see like a, a vertical dependency and topology model mm -hmm. on the left hand side so mm -hmm. how things are being deployed and where and how they you know relate to each other mm -hmm. but also like a dependency from a, like a software architecture point of view mm -hmm. so like how these microservices actually uh, work with each other mm -hmm. like which service is calling which other service mm -hmm. uh, and this is great yeah, which is because we do automated distributed tracing down to code level so not just looking at one service talking to another, well that's what we have anyway, yeah. but then we also get code level visibility, so if, and I'm not sure if a service flow is something that you may want to show. Yeah. So uh, this is what I wanted to point out now, mm -hmm. so the service flow, like the requests coming in here, um, actually ending up at the product catalog service, and what, what's really cool in here is that uh, 3,000 requests here, um, where in 70% of all the calls will actually call the recommend station service, mm -hmm. which is another Go uh, a service, and this one calls uh, the, product, the product catalog mm -hmm. uh, over here, um, so where you can see how things actually contribute uh, to, to the response time, and, and then you can even like uh, drill down and say, okay, this is what, you know, which is quite a common thing right now. Um, to, to get like this visibility into all these request traces. Mm -hmm. In our case, in, in Dynatrace, we just call it QPath. We actually uh, in, in invented uh, this, this uh, let's say, tracing capabilities uh, where you can really then uh, deep dive and see, okay, um, point down and see, okay, what is the response time to this single request mm -hmm. and, and how this uh, request actually um, traversed through, through the system. Yeah. So really like this, this this, this phenomenal waterfall charts mm -hmm. out of the box without adding a single line of code. And that's the, the cool thing you actually mentioned. That we invented it. People may say, well, who invented this? Distributed tracing is something completely new. At least it seems like it in uh, social media and when people talk about it, but distributed tracing is nothing new. We've been doing it since the inception of Dynatrace, which was 2005. Um, so we've been, we have quite some experience, I would say, in doing distributed create distributed tracing down to code level across the microservice architectures uh, and with uh, zero configuration, zero code change. That's great. Yeah. All right, so this is what I actually wanted to show you uh, regarding how easy it actually is to deploy, um, let's say, microservices on a Kubernetes environment. In this case, there is like an additional framework being included, uh, Knative, which is in this case, uh, also makes use of Istio, mm -hmm. like a service mesh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of the vendors out there somehow uh, create their own version or distribution of a service mesh mm -hmm. uh, right now. So it also seems to be an important topic, yeah. uh, which which helps for let's say routing traffic uh, between these this, this microservices. So as you can see, also out of the box support uh, mm -hmm. for that for that here. In my second piece, I uh, wanted to highlight. So this was one cluster I was running on GKE, mm -hmm. GKE on-prem in this case, um, deploying the, this hipster shop. I also deployed uh, just before the, the webinar uh, today, before the performance clinic today, I also deployed the same thing on a cluster on AKS. Okay. And um, it's exactly the same setup. Mm -hmm. It's not GKE, it's AKS in this time. Mm -hmm. um, same format, we have Istio and Knative in there. I think it's a different container runtime, but actually that's not a, a, a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did is uh, basically, let me go back to last two hours, 
Um, what I did is I, I increased the number of load generators for this environment. And it happens to be here. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, let's say, uh, yeah, 15 minutes. here, um, which is, uh, let's go back to that last two hours here again, um, which, which can we see here, like this increase of load of, of CPU uh, time here, uh, this is when I started the load generator. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what, yeah. what we also see is that Dynatrace automatically highlights that, that, that there, are, there are two unhealthy nodes, that's why you see the two uh, red dots in your honeycomb chart, and that means Over if here. there's a problem, and because people always ask, so how can can, can damages also alert and trigger remediation actions? Yes, we can use this information and trigger an Ansible script. We can trigger a, we can send a Slack message. We can talk with Captain, our open source uh, project for auto remediation or any other tools. Right? This is all all there, all through the APIs and all through uh, uh, notifications as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, on the right hand side, um, we show you uh, like the hipster shop, mm -hmm. uh, the hipster shop is doing, yeah. and we also see that there are two services being affected. Yeah, wow. Um, and um, let's see which ones, <laughs> actually, I um, haven't had time to look at it. Yeah, it seems that the front end is affected. Mm -hmm. um, we can see a pretty high response time here, uh, but also the checkup service. Uh, mm -hmm. being affected mm -hmm. and suffering from high response time um, and and we can we can jump into there uh, right now and see that okay so there we see this response time uh, increase um, we actually got the problem detected in Dynatrace of the box uh, where we on the one hand see through the load increase the impacted services, one is the checkup service, the other one is the front end. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the root cause was that we, we, we actually have issues in the front end because of the CPU separation on the nodes and we also detected some uh, metric uh, anomalies uh, in here and I would actually expect that we see the load increase mm -hmm. uh, 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 in here. We, we also see like all these components that have been involved uh, in in this uh, uh, problem, and we can even like replay uh, and see how the load increase on my Kubernetes environment with Knative and my hipster shop through the load generator actually, um, you know, um, you know, make our environment uh, unhealthy, yeah. right? So all these components, so there's the front end, there's this, this checkup service, um, there is like one of the nodes that, that actually uh, suffer from high CPU usage and how they actually uh, are being connected with each other. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So that's, that, that's something I wanted to, to point out here, um, that once everything, you know, just deploying stuff, with uh, like a decent amount of load, everything is fine. But if you increase the load, mm -hmm. uh, there might be situations where you 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 are being in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, um, on the cluster side, but also on on the on the uh, backend side mm -hmm. uh, with these two services. And if you, if you can recall, I mean we have the other one here as well. So this one is running with a single instance of the load generator. Mm -hmm with 7,000 requests on the front end and a response time of 100 milliseconds, whereas the other one has 180,000 requests mm -hmm. uh, with almost two seconds of response time. Mm -hmm. So this is really uh, uh, impressive here yeah. uh, to see how, how this actually um, you know, evolved over time. Mm -hmm. Cool, so that means what I, what, I, what I get from this, and there's also some questions coming in, um, in order to get this level of visibility, in, in order for Dynatrace to detect the hosts, the pods, the services, the only thing you need to do is roll out the one agent. 
Dynatrix Dynatrix automatically detects when the hosts does full stack monitoring. It detects the services. Now there's a question from Joe coming in. He has also installed Dynatrace on his AKS cluster. And uh, he has uh, he has said that some of the services, there's a lot of services we show, but right? mm -hmm. all the services. And maybe if you want to do me a favor, Alois, could you click on transactions uh, and services to see that you know, Dynatrace really detected all of this? So Joe's question goes in a in the direction where he said there's a lot of services and some of them for him uh, you know might not be meaningful. He doesn't know what they are because there's, like, everything is monitored. Like he has one that is called just colon 1461 from Cube Service Redirect. So what that means, I mean in your case you have nice names, email service, front end, and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. That means depending on the code that is running, if it's Java or Go or Node. We automatically uh, extract metadata from these services and then automatically name the services based on what we think makes sense based on our experience. But you can also overwrite this. You can also define your own naming rules. You can yeah. you can add metadata and then give give Dynatrace better better details on what it should be displaying it for. That that's correct. So what we basically do is based on our technology, we read the name that um, was defined by the developer. Mm -hmm. um, so you usually have like a servlet name or something mm -hmm. like this. Um, I don't know the details in, in, in Go, uh, but usually there is a place where uh, a developer decided to give his new service, his new name, yeah. and we always try to pick this name. Mm -hmm. And this is why we often uh, see like m way more services in Dynatrace than uh, someone would actually expect, mm -hmm. because sometimes even like the developers are surprised that there is a service still running mm -hmm. and still getting traffic, mm -hmm. uh, so which is kind of like a, a a huge benefit to really see what is the 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 real time and the actual let's say software architecture in your environment, not not depending and not let's say trusting UML diagrams mm -hmm. or architecture diagrams. It's really kind of like figuring out what's running where and how does the, the architecture really look like. Mm -hmm. So since you uh, been referring to the uh, naming rules, so mm -hmm. in Dynatrace, so it's not specific to Kubernetes, mm -hmm. so it's something we build in general, of course, what we always try to do uh, is uh, we have a, a feature called uh, service naming rules, so where you can define rules, uh, where you can actually then define how things are should be named. So you can define a rule here which says, it's my Kubernetes rule, and I would like to have, for any reason, the namespace, I'm not sure if this makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, but, but for Kubernetes, the namespace should be part of the service name, mm -hmm. for any reason, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I actually would like to have the, the real detected service name, uh, it's somewhere down there, um, service, not the remote name. I think it's the web server name. Let me check real quick. I think it's this one. Um, web server name. Did you see it? Link yeah, detected. This detected. One. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, or is it the detected name? I think it's the detected name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that one. There you go. Uh, so you can put everything in there that you actually would like to get. So what uh, make you available here is the, all the properties that we detect from an agent, mm -hmm. which means like technology specific properties of your process, kind of like Java properties that you define for your Java process, for your JVM, also properties that are related to the environment where this application is running, in mm -hmm. this case the Kubernetes environment, so we also detect the namespace the part a certain process is running in, so you can also add these properties here for renaming your services. Uh, then you define just, okay, where do you would like to apply this, and actually it would make sense to, to apply it, uh, sorry, everywhere where we have an, a namespace. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes namespace exists probably, right? That's yeah. What wanna do. Uh, over here, where a Kubernetes namespace exists. Well, maybe it's just a certain name pattern, whatever yeah. it is, yeah, and then preview. That's Let's awesome. do a preview, yeah. and now you will see this one called 8080, yeah. <laughs> the bad name, by yeah. the way. Uh, it's now being called Hipster Shop Kennedy 8080. Yeah. Right. But you could also say, you know, give me any other name or maybe from an yeah, environment yeah. variable. I think that's yeah. also what Joe is, is re referring to. Uh, Joe just told me that 
he's been installing this on AKS, and he also has uh, some AKS uh, components installed around, um, I think, loading the loading platform. That means he's actually seeing all of these, these services that enable I wasn't even aware of are in there. And now Dana just picks them up, and uh, that's pretty yes. cool. Um, the other question, can you use labels in the naming rules? So we can you pull in annotations and labels? <clears throat> so when you, when you talk about Kubernetes, labels and annotations, you can... That could also work, yeah. uh, that you can also use these, these labels. So we also, so you can not only do that for, for services, mm -hmm. but also you can somehow rename your, your hosts. Mm, okay, yeah. So you can also use labels for that. So we also import the host labels um from 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 the API and you can use that as well as you can pretty cool yeah and and another thing that just comes to mind uh, two weeks or three weeks ago I did a performance clinic with um, uh, Q methods they implement a new service on top of Dynatrace called Versio where they actually extract the data from Dynatrace through the API the smartscape mm -hmm. and all the all the dependencies all the metadata and then they're using this to keep an historical track but also to enforce let's say, governance and risk and compliance rules. So you could even use the Dynatrace data in combination with Versio to say, I want to make sure that my developers are doing a good job in naming the services as they should be named. You can define, you can also enforce checks that that's really, that's really nice as well. Cool. Um, and uh, there was another question by Laurent, uh, whether you can define this, the naming of also processes and services. So it's yes, the same. it's yeah. the same thing. So you can, you, there's a, you're very flexible, uh, Laurent, you may want to check out one of my performance clinics that I did on, I think I called it one-on-one -on -one tagging, and there's like a, 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 there's a couple of performance clinics that you can find online about different aspects of, of these types of configurations. And there's also the help portal that will help you uh, to figure out yeah. how to do that. Yeah. Uh, so there are process group naming rules, there's mm -hmm. service naming rules, there's host naming rules, uh, everything in there. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out um, is um, so we have this, this new Kubernetes entry point here on the left-hand side, mm -hmm. uh, which I briefly explained uh, in, in, in the slide deck. So, so this is actually um, the thing that where we uh, get like additional information from the Kubernetes API mm -hmm. and combine it with the, with the information that we get from, from the agent. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that the chart that we already uh, are familiar with, uh, which is about the cluster utilization, so figuring out why things uh, or how things are, are scaling in your environment and whether you, you still have enough workload mm -hmm. or enough uh, nodes uh, being available for additional workloads. We can analyze here, we can even like see, okay, what happened during this time frame here, so analyze further. And there is a new chart which, which we introduced, it's called the like, uh, distribution chart. Um, where you can actually see, okay, how many nodes actually have a certain amount of, of, of requests already mm -hmm. um, um, booked, mm -hmm. and you can then filter down and even like drill down and see like all these these metrics that I that you are familiar with when you do like this kubectl uh, commands. So this was one piece. Um, the other one about uh, these events, mm -hmm. as you can see here, it's a sneak peek mm -hmm. uh, on the events topic. Um, so you can uh, then drill down and see, okay, which events actually happened here. Uh, so I scale something here. I would expect quite some stuff being started here. Mm -hmm. So there are other events um, where we just, you know, pool all the rest, the rest of the events uh, here. Mm -hmm. So you can really drill down and see, okay, what is actually happening in Kubernetes, um, and we import that here, visualize it here, so that you can analyze uh, what what actually happened in your cluster, mm -hmm. and, and this is also being um, um, taken into consideration when when we detect problems. That's awesome. That's just what I wanted to ask. So that means if you detect, hey, services are degrading because of the high CPU or because of something else, you could say, and we we also saw our heavy restarts of something else or a heavy deployment of something else. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, there are the, there's the question again about the, the availability of some of these features that are still in development. I think you mentioned early next year. Yeah. Right? So uh, that's something. Um, the other question, and Luis, I think we have a performance clinic on this already, but he's asking what's the difference in the menu on the left between Kubernetes and Docker, right? 
All right, so Kubernetes is really like an overview of your Kubernetes cluster, mm -hmm. um, like multiple nodes, the workloads that are being deployed there, the events, uh, much more to come. The Docker view is uh, a view on, on single Docker hosts, mm -hmm. uh, which will really work only for Docker. Uh, and uh, we are working on coming up with a more generic approach here as well. Uh, to not only have like a dedicated view for Docker, mm -hmm. uh, but also like for all the generic container runtimes like Cryo, Containerd, also Garden containers mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to Cloud Foundry uh, and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so this is basically the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, then the um, just uh, Laurent is asking. Uh, not Laurent, sorry, it's the Pietro is asking. Uh, when all the scaling happens up or down, uh, Dynamatrix keeps historical data, especially when things are, let's say, being being uh, scaled down. So that means you can always go back. Obviously, now nothing is lost; all the data is there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Luis has been asking twice now. Luis, I didn't I didn't forget your uh, question earlier. In your specific uh, environment here, whether you run on Kubernetes or on on, on OpenShift, uh, you installed the one agent. So what type of licenses are actually consumed, right? Um, he's asking host units, obviously. Yeah. Right? So like the, the regular licensing that, that we have uh, mm -hmm. anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So when you deploy the operator, mm -hmm. the operator will roll out the one agent, and the one agent licensing will will um, will, will apply. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then because he's asking, so what about RAM? If you enable real user monitoring, obviously. It's, it's always the same. It's always the same. So it's yeah. not different to any other. Mm -hmm. um, part. Yeah, cool. And then I think a question earlier around licensing. Eric, I didn't forget about your question. He was asking in the very beginning the licensing models. Uh, and I know we're both not in sales, so I think we always want to be careful uh, what we what we tell. And I think just talk with your with your sales with your account team. But um, is licensing always based on let's say uh, size of the hosts, or is there also an option to say just by capacity? So that means if somebody is deploying a large cluster, but right now they're not really utilizing it, would it something like be really a utilization based on, on the clusters? I think that's a question that Eric wants to understand. Um, so while we, we are working on um, on things there on this front, but uh, right now uh, it's, it's, it's something that you would need to, to talk to your uh, account. account exec or okay, whatever. Okay. Uh, it's a sales mm -hmm. uh, topic at the moment. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then the other thing, and I know we have about you know, five more Five more minutes. Do you have? Are you otherwise done? done because then I'm done basically. Yeah, because then I'm just walking really through through the questions here a little bit. Uh, so first of all, Pedro, there are no stupid questions. It's great what he asked. So that's why everybody, please ask your questions. Uh, we answered the Kubernetes thing. Uh, by the way, he was asking, are we where's our home, our new office? He likes it. It's Linz, and it's not Mozart's hometown. Almost at Salzburg. So a little geography lesson here, but it's very close. Um, the other thing, what uh, the question uh, I think we came up in the beginning, if you want to have monitoring of just microservices and you don't want to have full stack monitoring, is there also an option to do microservice monitoring without the full stack mode? Yes, there is. Um, so we, we have uh, the capabilities that you can uh, deploy the one agent code modules to like the, the microservices you would like to monitor specifically um, but uh, I would highly encourage you to to actually um, take into, into consideration the full stack option because mm -hmm. this is actually where you will benefit the most out of it because you will get not only let's say service visibility with all this tracing and metrics and, and, and code level visibility but you will also get the policy information, mm. uh, logs, and, and all that stuff, right? Uh, and and you would not need to to you know build monitoring into your deployments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Dynatrace has a pretty cool approach in doing that, mm -hmm. so it's really easy as, as well, mm -hmm. the dev only approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, you need to to actually modify then. The, the deployment YAML, for instance, to run an additional init container mm -hmm. um, to, to make the agent available to your microservice. You still do not need to change your, uh, your Docker images and your yeah. code. Yeah. It's only fully automated, but you, of course, need to touch your, your deployment configs. Mm -hmm. um, we, we see, and our customer base actually mostly 
um, run full stack. Mm -hmm. And we see this also the better option. Yeah. Perfect. And I think that's also the um, James is asking, so how do you differentiate then against open source uh, tools like Prometheus and, and Grafana? I think if you see this, uh, it, it should hopefully be obvious what the difference is. It's the out-of-the-box full-stack monitoring, end-to-end -end tracing, including real user monitoring, log monitoring, system monitoring without code change. Everything is just there. We have the dependency map. We do automatic multi-dimensional baselining. We do automatic uh, anomaly detection. And we do this not only for Kubernetes, but we do this for your, your true enterprise environment, which may, for some of our customers, still include the mainframe. It still includes you know, application servers that have been popular 5, 10, 20 years ago. And I think that's the big thing. And you don't need to spend and invest time and resources in building these things and maintaining them. We do this all for you. Yeah. And the additional pieces, we, we add context, right? Yeah. So all these open source tools are working on, like, on, on silos. Mm -hmm. uh, they miss context. Uh, this is what we what we get through the agent mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the topology information through the API. So we have context and we scale. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, having like the the visibility on on the infrastructure side, on the container side, on on, on the application side, meaning like the microservices uh, down to the code level, database statements, service tracing, but also real user monitoring. Mm -hmm is kind of like the best weapon you can have mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to, to make sure that your infrastructure, your applications, everything is, is running in a healthy state. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, we had a discussion that we are lo obviously looking into things like Prometheus so we can ingest the data from Prometheus and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, uh, Alois, we are basically almost out of time. Uh, could you do me a favor and quickly go to the slides? Um, Folks, I know there's still questions coming in about pod visibility, health visibility. I think you've seen this. Uh, you get automatic visibility into the pods, into the health. This, this is all there. Just give it a try. I think that's the best. Uh, and actually, let's turn on the camera quickly if you can, because I think we actually we are not that ugly, right? Uh, but we just needed a little more real estate. Pretty. <laughs> exactly. Um, so if you have any more questions, make sure you check out all the other resources out there. There's a lot of ton of information on university in the documentation, the performance clinics, also the podcast that we have. So check it out. And if you want to get started and try it yourself, just go to dynatrace.com and sign up for the trial. Last but not least, Alois, if you can do me one more thing. There's Perform coming up. In Vegas, we're going to be there. Yep. Right? So uh, this is our big user conference, uh, early February, with two hot days, two hands-on training days, Monday and Tuesday, hands-on training where you can get hands-on experience with all different sorts of topics. And then there's two days of conference where we have a lot of customers present on how they use Dynatrace on these modern environments. And yes, the PowerPoints will be shared. The recording will be up on YouTube and Dynatrace University. And the PowerPoint will also be uploaded to the Dynatrace University piece. And Alois, with that, it's always a pleasure. It's amazing how... Uh, how much we, I mean, it's, it's amazing what the product can do. Yep. Right? And there's a lot of stuff coming, so I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll have you back soon. Yep. Right? Well, thanks, Andy, and thanks for joining. Yeah. And thanks, Denise, for recording, and thanks for the audience for the great questions. In case we didn't answer uh, some of the questions again, ask them through answers.dynatrix.com, or I'm sure you'll find ways to get a hold of us. Thank you, and bye-bye. <laughs>